Another subtle yet devastating aspect of the global conspiracy is their manipulation of calendars, clocks, and our perception of time. We are being enslaved by man-made mechanisms and systems for keeping time. Not only are we wage slaves to bankers, governments, bosses, and landowners, but we are also time slaves to our watches, clocks, and calendars. We slave to nine to five school and work days. We slave to five day school and work weeks. We are spiritual slaves to Greenwich Mean Time, the Gregorian calendar, and an unnatural seven day week. Buried Inside from Chronoclast wrote, Time is the primary socializing tool and the clock is the key machine of industrial capitalism. The imperialism of space and material is everywhere evident, but the imperialism of time is a shadowy beast. What is of direct concern is how time is perceived, controlled, exploited, manipulated, institutionalized, and internalized. If we do not understand time, we become its victims. One thing remains apparent. Time politics are power politics. Every sundial, water mill, calendar, week cycle, social policy, and temporal monument has served a particular interest and in ideology. The hallmark of these, of course, has always been technological power and chauvinist control. In the service of precision, the atomic second is now defined as the duration of 9,192,631,770 particle oscillations within a cesium-133 atom. If you follow the sun and moon to keep track of time instead of clocks and watches, many things change. If stores open at sunup and close at sundown, managers cannot anally enforce punching time cards. If you tell your friends to meet you at the river when the sun touches the tree line, you naturally, patiently wait for them while watching a beautiful sunset. If you tell your friends to meet you at the mall at 7.30 p.m., then you must constantly look at your wrist or the wall watching a series of cumulatively frustrating numbers. Samuel Macy wrote, That people can be characterized as wound up, run down, rusty, or going like clockwork is essentially a product of 17th century thought. It implies not only that their work may be accurately measured, but also that their motions can be studied. Given proper incentives, they will follow predetermined and appropriately mechanical patterns. When indoctrinated into meaningless calendars, like the Gregorian and Julian, wristwatches, nine-to-five workdays, and five-day work weeks, people most certainly do follow predetermined, mathematically calculable patterns and tendencies. We like to have a drink after work. We like to watch a movie at the weekend. We like coffee in the mornings. We buy flowers on Valentine's Day, and so on. Our tendencies can be calculated and exploited by elites. Those who exist outside the constraints of time, wage slavery, have all the time and money they need to perform studies, hire psychologists, lobbyists, and advertisers to further their gains. Time is money, so they say. Jeremy Rifkin wrote, In hierarchical time culture, status is often delineated in terms of how valuable a person's time is. The time poor are made to wait, while the temporally privileged are waited upon. Jose Argules wrote, Gets us back to the theme of time is money. No wonder time is money is ingrained into our consciousness and culture, and that seems to be the main purpose of the calendar we use, to keep track of our accounts, pay our bills, and set up our appointments. We might not think about it this way, but the calendar we use programs us to use it the way we do. But are all calendars like this one? Nothing more than an arbitrary program to take care of business? What about the sun, the moon, and the stars? Okay, let's keep this one point in mind. A calendar is a programming device. It programs the culture, the people, the society that uses it. It creates a feedback loop between the mind of the user and its program. The nature of the calendar determines the nature of the society. Buried Inside wrote, Secured at birth and bred as fresh livestock, to the power brokers of hypercapitalism, our lives are on the auction block. Make way for the experience economy. Make way for the access economy. Make way for the new time currency. Welcome it all like the coming of Rome. Karl Marx wrote in Das Kapital that to work at a machine, 
the workman should be taught from childhood in order that he may learn to adapt his own movements to the uniform and unceasing motion of an automaton. This statement has been implemented into our government and corporate institutions in many ways. Students align themselves with the approximate 9 to 5, 8 hour workday, 5 days a week. We take this coincidence for granted or explain it away by the convenience of aligning work and school schedules for daycare purposes. But in reality, what it instills is this psychological mechanism of slavishly submitting to the regulated schedules of employers. Also, the factory-like seating and positioning of a boss at the blackboard giving out standardized directives is a product of the industrial age. Without this long-term conditioning from a young age, would we so willingly sell our lives for minimum wage? Jeremy Rifkin wrote, we are making the transition into what economists call an experience economy, a world in which each person's own life becomes, in effect, a commercial market. In business circles, the new operative term is the lifetime value of the customer, the theoretical measure of how much a human being is worth if every moment of his or her life were to be commodified in one form or another in the commercial sphere. Time has been broken down for us in many ways, some of which make sense and others which seem senseless. Many delineations of time have astronomical significance, which seem sensible. The sun and earth's interaction gives us a yearly cycle. The moon's lunation pattern gives us a monthly cycle. The constant rising and falling of sun and moon gives us a daily cycle. And the tides give us a natural quarter-day cycle as they come in and out. All other delineations of time, however, are arbitrary and man-made. The fast-ticking second appears nowhere in nature, except when people claim it resembles a human heartbeat, but this too is arbitrary, because human heartbeat constantly changes pace. The minute, named after min, the moon, is also an invented cycle with no actual parallel in nature. The hour, named after Horus, the Egyptian Jesus, who divides the days and nights into twelve equal parts, is an ancient myth but not a cycle found in nature. The worst and most spiritually enslaving of the created cycles, however, is undoubtedly the weak. Because of this ludicrous, unnatural cycle, almost everyone in the world, no matter what their life was like the past seven days, ends up being almost exactly the same the next seven days. Every seven times the sun rises and falls, most of the world's population hits the replay button on their life and continues repeating the same pattern and schedule like a skipping record for their entire existence. The worst part is that we have been so indoctrinated into the weak system that every little facet of modern society, from schools to paychecks to TV programs, are irreversibly locked in. Jose Argules wrote, Blue Monday, how I hate Blue Monday, is how the old Fats Domino song began. Why is that? because, of course, that is the first day of the five-day work week. Fats Domino must have had some clue about time killing us, otherwise it wouldn't have to be Blue Monday. So Monday through Friday, for most employed people, as well as schools and public and government institutions, is the work week. Then comes Saturday and Sunday, the week end. The work week is ruled by the clock, which is why it is also referred to as 9 to 5. Saturday and Sunday should be soul time, but is it? Well, a little bit. There is Sunday church, maybe an hour or so for the soul, or maybe Saturday synagogue. But what is it really about, these weekends? It's about killing more time. It's sports and entertainment. It's football and basketball and baseball, big time. If you are in the rest of the world, it's soccer, very big time. If it weren't for television, this stuff wouldn't be so big, but it all goes hand in hand. Television, the weekend, and big-time sports. It is all a part of the same thing. I know, maybe you don't do that. Maybe you do something else. You go skiing or windsurfing. Maybe you go to the movies. Or you go dancing. Or maybe gambling down at the casino. Or you watch the Discovery Channel. Or you take a self-help workshop. It doesn't matter, because then it is going to be Monday again, and the whole sequence repeats. The point is, your whole show, the time of your life, does reduce down to this weekly pattern, and it is killing you. You are putting your soul in a seven-day straitjacket. When the soul suffocates, you only get more bored and need more distractions. Do you see what's going on? You are hardly even alive.
because it's your soul that really lives, and if you are not giving your soul the time it needs, then time is killing you. That means the time of the calendar and the clock that is embedded in your mind. But you are now becoming aware of it. This is a great first step. You can now say, I admit that I was powerless over the time I have blindly accepted all my life. One ancient secret society symbol often found on clocks and watches is the anchor. This shape of a typical ship's anchor is actually two Egyptian hieroglyphs put together. The top part of the anchor, shaped like a cross with a circle at the top, is the Egyptian Ankh, hence the name Ankhor. The bottom is shaped like the Egyptian boats of the dead, which carried souls during the afterlife. Two words which are often under the anchor symbol on clocks as well, king time, likely signifying the royal brotherhood manipulation of time. Buried inside wrote, The calendar year is an imperial narrative. The seven-day week is an imperial infliction. Circannual holidays are imperial flagposts. Mechanical time is an imperial installation. The merchant workday is an imperial offering. Greenwich Mean Time is an imperial sanction. The word calendar comes from the Roman Latin calends, which was the name of the account book, the book recording monthly debts and bills to be paid. The first day of each month in the early Christian Julian calendar was called calends, and that was when you had to pay your bills and debts. A quick look at the calendar will present some oddities even to the casual observer. September means seven, but is the ninth month. October means eight, but is the tenth month, and so on. March is named for Mars, the Roman god of war, and July and August are named after Roman emperors Julius and Augustus Caesar. The calendar we use is called the Gregorian, after Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. Jose Argules wrote, Yes, before it was known as the Gregorian calendar, it was called the Julian, after Julius himself. Turns out the Romans had a very faulty calendar of only ten months, and Julius, wanting a way to make a permanent change from republic to empire, with himself as the first emperor, decided to change the calendar. So to make the change, during the year 46 to 45 BC, Julius had to have a year 445 days long. Understandably, that was known as the year of confusion. Julius didn't live beyond the Ides of March of the year 45 BC when he was assassinated for what he had done. But the empire prevailed. Julius was followed by Augustus Caesar, who made a further change in the calendar. He saw that Julius had changed the name of the month Quintilius to Julius, July. So Augustus changed the next month, Sextilius, to Augustus, August. Not only that, Sextilius only had 30 days, while Julius had 31 days. Augustus wanted to make his renamed month August as long as Julius's month. So what did he do? He took the 29th day off February, already the shortest month, and added it to his month. That is why August, like July, has 31 days, and February only 28. So that is how the calendar began. Despotic motives, imperial pretensions, and confusion. The Christians began using the Julian calendar around 321 AD, when they added the seven-day week to it. The seven-day week was borrowed from the Hebrew lunar calendar, the Jews borrowed the seven-day week from the Babylonians. The seven-day week never correlates perfectly any of the months, except when February 1st might fall on a Sunday. Then there will be four perfect seven-day weeks in a month. The moon goes around the earth 13 times in one year. 13 times 28 equals 364, plus one day equals 365 days, one solar year. The ancients all used 13 moon 28-day calendars and celebrated the extra day, always on July 25th, as the day out of time, when the rising great star Sirius peaks. The Druids, Incans, Mayans, Egyptians, Polynesians, Lakota, and many other cultures all used 28-day moon calendars. David Icke wrote, The native peoples of the world who still live by moon time are far more in tune with nature because they are operating on the same time energy flow as nature they are in sync with it. But in 1572, Pope Gregory announced that a new calendar was to be introduced, the Gregorian calendar, and it was implemented in October 1582. 
it was another brotherhood scam, and the Gregorian calendar became the fixed standard time for the planet. This means that the human mind is tuned to this manufactured flow of time when we look at a clock, a watch, or plan the future with a diary. And where is the center of this time system? The zero point from which all the world's people tune their timepieces? Why, it's only Greenwich in London, across the River Thames, from the City of London Financial District, the Brotherhood's operational heartland. And what was the inspiration for the Gregorian calendar? The one used in Babylon. The Gregorian calendar is a farce. It is the time equivalent of throwing all your clothes in a wardrobe and leaning against the door to stop it flinging open. The clothes may just about fit in the space if you push them in hard enough, but what a mess. Here we have a 12-month year of 60-minute hours and 24-hour days, with the month so ill-fitting that some are 30 days, others 31, another 28 or 29 every four years. Yes, fits like a glove. But a sensible measurement of time was not the motivation. Disconnecting human consciousness from moon time was the idea, and the Gregorian calendar removed the 13th moon. There should be 13 moon cycle months of 28 days, but instead we have 12 months and 12 moon cycles. The Brotherhood hierarchy still operates their calendars to moon time, another reason for their obsession with 13. Months are not a proper unit of time, are they? A month is either 28, 29, 30, or 31 days long. In common parlance, we talk about a month being four weeks long, but they're not. Only February is exactly four weeks long, and even then, that's only true three quarters of the time. 94% of months are longer than a month. We know exactly how many seconds in a minute, how many minutes in an hour, hours in a day, and days in a week. We even know exactly how many months in a year. But the months themselves are a mystery. They <laughs> chop and change. Let me give you an example, okay? Let's talk about something real, human pregnancy. Okay, we've all learned this all our lives, we all know. How many months are we told an average human pregnancy should last? Nine. Nine, very good. Nine months. Now, hands up if you are a parent. Okay, parents, how many weeks were you told, on average, your pregnancy would last? Forty. Forty weeks is ten bloody months, isn't it? <laughs> ten months, we've been built our whole lives. You spend your whole life as a woman thinking if you get pregnant it'll be nine months and then you get there and you discover it's actually ten. You've been conned, haven't you? Let's look at the year. How many months are there in a year? Twelve. Twelve. Exactly. How many weeks are there in a year? Fifty-two. Fifty-two. Good. However, twelve months... Well, 12 times 4 is 48. And 52 minus 4 is 48. Doesn't take a genius to work out, we've got four extra weeks. And what do four weeks make? A month. There are actually 13 months in a year. We are being paid for 12 months' work, and we are doing 13 months' work a year. This is outrageous. This is absolutely outrageous. And I, I have a solution. I have reformed the calendar. <laughs> Let me be clear, it is not just the lack of rigour that I have issue with. I have another issue with months, a linguistic one. These are the months as we know them today. Take a look at the word October. Oct. Think of all the other words you know beginning with oct. <laughs> Octopus, octagon, octogenarian. Think of all the words you know beginning with dec. Decade, decimal, decathlon. You don't have to be the sharpest linguist out there to realise that sept, oct, nov, dec represents seven, eight, nine, ten. And yet we've put them in positions nine, ten, eleven, twelve. <laughs> why has that happened? I'll tell you why that's happened. It's because of the bloody Romans. Before that, we used to have months called Quintilus and Sextilus. It used to be five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But then the Romans got all egotistical on us. They wanted to name two months after their emperors. They named months after Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar. Can you imagine the ego involved in naming a month after a human being? It's one thing naming it after a god. You know, you've got January after Janus, that's OK. Mars gives you March, that's OK. I mean, if you believe in a god, why wouldn't you want to venerate them by naming something as fundamental as a period of time after them? That makes sense. 
but not an actual human being. Get your egos out of the game. That is ridiculous. Well, they have confused things by naming July and August so, and then everything got moved around at a later date. So what we're going to do, we're going to correct this system. The first thing we're going to do is sort out the numbering, obviously. So let's call that 7, 8, 9, 10, because they are called 7, 8, 9, 10. That's what they are. So if they're going to be 7, 8, 9, 10, it follows, does it not, that that becomes 6, 5, 4, 3, 2 and 1. So if that's what the numbers are going to be now, let's move July and August down to there, and let's move January and February down to there. So now we've got all the same months in the same order, it's just the numbering is more appropriate. OK? That's easy. Now, let's remove the egotistical Romans from our calendar. Let's remove Julius Caesar, remove Augustus Caesar. Let's perform a Caesarean section on our calendar. <laughs> let's remove them completely and replace them with the months they replaced, Quintilus and Sextilus, which are now in the right place, five and six. That is the numbering sorted out. We've got five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, exactly where they should be. Now, obviously, is the time we introduce the 13th month, which, of course, will be Gormanuary. <laughs> now, <laughs> what we've got there is 13 months of exactly 28 days long. Everything ticks over perfectly. March the 1st, New Year's Day, will always be a Sunday because nobody wants to go straight back to work on New Year's Day, do they? And it will always be a Sunday because of the order in the calendar. The first of every month will always be a Sunday. The second of every month will always be a Monday. And that means that New Year's Eve, the 28th of Gormanuary, will always be a Saturday. Now, it might have occurred to some of you, it might have occurred to some of you, that 13 times 28 is 364. And that means we've got a day spare. We can't force the year to only be 364 days long. The year is to do with the stars and the planets. So what we're going to do is, after Gormanuary, we're going to have an intermission. <laughs> It's one day long, it's not called Sunday, it's not called Monday, it's not called anything. It isn't a day of the week, it is just intermission. It is basically an extended New Year's piss-up. You can go out on New Year's Eve, you don't have to go back until the 1st of March, everything is fine, what happens in intermission stays in intermission. <laughs> and every fourth year, we have a two-day intermission, and we call both of those days intermission. That's all it is. That regulates everything. Everything flows in a very orderly fashion from that point on. We have talked previously on this show about the old 30 days hath September rhyme. I think we can all agree that this system improves upon that rhyme. The rhyme now goes 28 days hath March, April, May and June. All the rest have 28 too, because that's how long a month is. There you go. It's much, it's much, much easier. Much easier. I'm confident in this. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the PowerPoint down for a moment. I'm just going to say, any questions? Any questions about the system? Yes, sir. When are the bank holidays? The bank holidays. We have the same number of bank holidays as we do now. We spread them evenly throughout the year. Very easy. The only difference will be the people we won't let have a holiday are the ones who work in banks. <laughs> it's an improvement on bank holidays right there. Right there. The lady in the T-shirt. What if you're born on the 30th or the 31st of the month? Do you just move it along to the next month? You're asking about birthdays? Yeah, birthdays. Yeah, yeah, OK, I'm glad you asked. Uh, birthdays. <laughs> um... <laughs> Well, let's use my birthday as an example, because everyone's birthday is going to change in this new system, right? I was born on March the 2nd, 1971. So the first thing you have to do is work out how many days into the year that was. So, for example, in me, it's quite easy. You know there's 31 days in January in the old system, uh, 28 days in February in both systems, and it wasn't a leap year, so there were just 28 days. 31 plus 28 plus the two days take you to the 2nd of March makes it the 61st day of the year. Then you map that onto the new calendar, OK? Very easily done for this. Uh, 28 for March, 28 for April, that's 56. Uh, leaves five spare. So my new birthday becomes May the 5th. March the 2nd, 61st day of the year, is May the 5th. And you do that with every day. It's very simple. I've actually got a little guide to help you. Um, <laughs> This is my, this is an old calendar, you know, using the current system, and I've mapped every day onto it, and lots of things are improved uh, by doing this. For example, you know, you want to keep all the nice holidays and festivals and little sort of uh, celebrations we have in life, like April Fool's Day. We're not getting rid of April Fool's Day, but April the 1st is the 91st day of the year, and so in the new calendar, it becomes Saturday the 7th of June. And I think we, we can all agree it's going to be much easier to catch people out. Um, <laughs> knowing that, that's... 
That's better. Uh, November the 5th. Again, you don't want to move it to the new November the 5th because it wouldn't be getting dark early enough for November the 5th to make sense. So you keep it where it is, you just map it onto the new date. Uh, so, for example, if you just find November in the old calendar, November the 5th uh, would be the 309th day of the year, and so it now becomes Sunday the 1st of February uh, every time. And again, that's very easy to remember. You just use the rhyme, remember, remember the 1st of February. Uh, <laughs> So it's just a simple process of mapping things on. That is true for every holiday, every festival going. Very easy. Uh, we got one in the, towards the back there, yeah? Um, have you changed the staff signs? And if so, what's the new 13th one? My advice to astrologers would be to just keep making it up as they always did. <laughs> um, there's no... <laughs> doesn't matter. Doesn't matter for them. Yes, a uh, blonde lady down here? You do know that means there's going to be 13 Friday the 13th in the year. I do, yes. Every month has Every Friday month the 13th Friday now. The, 13th. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> the thing is, if you have to go through 13 Friday the 13th every year from the day you're born until the day you die, you're going to get over it. It's called exposure <laughs> therapy. <laughs> uh, yes, there's a man down here. What about uh, things that don't happen on a fixed day, like Easter or Chinese New Year? Easter, it isn't. You know, that's the thing. It moves around. It's a movable feast at this moment in time. In the new system, we will nail Easter down. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, it's the sort of everything. We're really happy. In fact, just looking through that, that calendar of the old system, which shows you how complicated it is, we've got a new calendar uh, and, and we'll have new merchandise to go with it. So, for example, you could get a calendar like this, right? The thing with this kind of calendar, now, every day is always the same day of the year. It's always a Sunday on March the 1st. We know that. The same system. So what we do with these calendars now, you produce them and they're wiped clean. <laughs> and then you've got one calendar for the rest of your life. That's less printing, less trees being killed. You can go anywhere. It doesn't have to be a sexy calendar like this. Um, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be, but... Uh... <laughs> but if it is, that doesn't matter because, like I say, it is wiped clean. So... Um... <laughs> That. That's an improvement all round as well, isn't it, really? Jose Argules wrote, On the Gregorian phonograph record, January 1st is part of the program. What plays on January 1st? Well, in this country, a lot of football bowl games. Then at the end of January sometime, you never know exactly when, it is the Super Bowl. February programs you for Valentine's Day and President's Day. July for July 4th. October for Halloween. December for Christmas and New Year's Eve, and so on. Now, September 11th, 9-11, is part of the program too. These are just some of the more obvious examples of how that phonograph record plays during one spin, a year. Every time one of those dates draws close, whole segments of the population respond in pre-established ways. There are a lot more programs the calendar plays. The beginnings and endings of wars, Veterans Day, Memorial Day, April Fools, Tax Day, Labor Day, the memories of all of these events are accumulated according to the dates in which they occur. Then everyone has personal dates that trigger their emotions and memories too, like the day you were born, or the day your son died, or when you got married. The Gregorian calendar is arbitrary and irregular. You would hardly ever think about any natural factors by using this calendar. January 1st doesn't correspond to any solstice or equinox or anything natural at all. With a program like that, of course you wouldn't think of the seasons or the moon when you use this calendar. It is almost as if this calendar is meant to keep you out of phase with nature. It is easy to overlook an unequal or irregular measure in time because we can't touch or see time. But would we overlook such an uneven standard in a yardstick or ruler? And if we were to go ahead and try to make or build things with an uneven ruler, wouldn't they come out crooked or sloppy? Maybe after a while, we would say, Oh, that's all right. We've lowered our standard to accommodate these sloppy constructions. You'll get used to it. We've always done it this way. But would you really settle for substandard measures of objects and forms in space? Yet we put up with substandard and uneven measures in time. Thinking it doesn't matter may already be an effect of accepting so long the uneven measure. If space affects our senses, time affects our mind. Therefore, the effects of a crooked time on the mind may be far more subtle, yet far worse than the effects of a crooked space on the senses. We could all develop a crooked mind without even knowing it. Wouldn't a crooked mind see the world in a crooked way and create problems for itself without knowing it? 
Not only that, but we would then think all of our problems come from someplace outside of ourselves. We would always be looking for the problems out there someplace. The female essence has long been associated with the moon, in large part because of women's 28-day menstruation cycle. The measure of the moon from new moon to new moon is called the synodic cycle, and is 29.5 days in length. However, the sidereal lunar cycle, which measures the moon from where it reappears in the same place in the sky, is only 27.1 days in length. So 28 days, already encoded into women's biological cycles, is the average lunar cycle. This is not coincidence either, proven by luminescent ovulation cycle adjustment, the patented process whereby using on sleeping women a series of lights mirroring light cycles of the moon, their ovulation cycles change. Patent 6497718. Ovulation is about 14 days, half cycle, before menstruation. So in ancient times, women the entire world over would usually have menstruation aligned with the new moon and ovulation aligned with the full moon. It has been shown that 20% more people are admitted into hospitals and mental health facilities during full moons. Could humans be sexually frustrated due to unnatural misalignments in women's biological cycles? Is this why lonely dogs howl for companionship during the full moon? Ancient societies would often hold monthly fertility ceremonies in honor of the moon, femininity. But nowadays, those who worship the moon and lunar cycles are called lunatics, monsters, and nuts. Those who measure time by the sun's solar calendar find solace. The etymology, again, points towards our illuminated mass stars and their sun worship. Most girls feel embarrassed or at least inconvenienced by their onset of womanhood. First periods are accompanied by tampons, pads, teasing schoolboys, and warnings or horror stories from other older women. Zaire tribes people, Native Americans, and other primitive cultures honor their women's first periods with puberty ceremonies. They believe each woman has incredible powers as a spiritual being, and the gift of life is an important event. During her first period, each girl is isolated from the tribe and taken by female relatives and friends to a special moon hut to be taught about sexuality and childbearing. She is taught arts and crafts, stories are shared, and wisdom is passed down. After her period of isolation, she is welcomed back with a big feast in her honor. In the ancient world, it was believed that women had amazing powers of healing and creativity during menstruation, so they should not be wasted on everyday tasks. Menstruation was a time women spent meditating and spiritual searching. The ancient Mayan calendar is slightly even more accurate than the Gregorian calendar we use today. They calculated the moon's orbit of the Earth incredibly precisely, 29.528395 days to our current 29.530588 day measurement. They could accurately predict solar and lunar eclipses and had amazing knowledge of astrology and the stars. Archaeologist Eric Thompson asks, What mental quirks led the Maya intelligentsia to chart the heavens, yet fail to grasp the principle of the wheel? To visualize eternity as no other semi-civilized people has ever done, yet ignore the short step from corbeled to true arch. To count in millions, yet never learn to weigh a sack of corn. The Mayan calendar measures cycles of expanding consciousness and completing one's purposes in life. Gauging the passing days like this changes the way one thinks of life. Modern societies tend to see time as a ticking time bomb till they die, a clockwork of standardized gears cranking until they get older, rusty, useless, and stop turning. The Mayans, like early Christians, believed in reincarnation, which fits with their calendar. They believed all of life was a spiritual evolution and an expanding of consciousness and purpose, so each day correlates as such. For instance, as I write this, today is the second day of the new jaguar moon of intention. Each moon has a spirit animal and purpose. Today's sulking is Skywalker the 13th, which means explore space wakefulness, the aspiration to unite heaven and earth. Today's power is activation. Today's action is bonding. And today's essence is service. Each day also has a color, a chakra, and a symbol as well. Now this may sound odd or appear as some new age foolishness, 
but this is a method of timekeeping used all over the ancient world. To associate the nature of time with the evolution of consciousness seems to me a much evolved outlook. The Maya knew about the 25,920 year procession of the equinoxes in which the position of the rising sun against the stars changed slightly for 2,160 years past each constellation of the zodiac. They even perfectly calculated the end date of this procession as December 21st, 2012. Jose Argulas wrote, The Christians set sail westward and discovered the new world. In a place called Yucatan, they discovered another people, the Maya. These Mayans also had a calendar, a heathen device that was more accurate than the Julian calendar. The Christians learned from the Mayan calendar that their calendar was ten days off. What to do? The Christians burned all of the Mayan books in 1562. Interestingly enough, ten years later, in 1572, there was a new pope. He named himself Gregory XIII, and declared that his first act as pope would be to correct the Julian calendar. Ten years later, 1582, Pope Gregory XIII had achieved his aim. If you went to bed on the evening of October 5th, 1582, when you woke up, it was October 16th, and not October 6th. Pope Gregory XIII had made up for this ten days, and the Julian calendar was now known as the Gregorian.